hello everyone. My name is Anton Bikiniev. I'm a software engineer at Kaspersky Lab. And I work in a team that develops an operating system, secure operating system called Kaspersky OS. It is worth saying for this talk that this operating system has a microkernel based design and therefore uses some typed IPC mechanisms to support communication between different services. Every such service is written in DSL language, which is then processed by a code generation tool that produces plain C and C++ code. Had we had a reflection facility in the language, we would have gotten rid of all these extra code generators. This is one of the reasons why I'm really looking forward to having this feature in the standard and why I try to follow all the reflection proposals and use. As you might have noticed, English is not my mother tongue, and I'm, I'm not always good at comprehending things verbally, but I will welcome all the questions during the talk. In case I can't find an answer quickly, we'll still be able to talk any time during the conference. So, the content of my talk is as follows. First, we will briefly discuss what reflection is, why it is needed in a programming language, even if it's already as big and complex as C++, and the whole philosophical perspective of reflection. I'm not going to talk about those hacks and macro-based solutions that I use today to work around the lack of reflection in the language, because I guess everybody has done it. Then we will get to those proposals that are still active today. And lastly, of course, we will look at some examples. But wait, why wait for the examples? Let's just quickly get a glimpse of what we, what we will be able to do with the reflection in C++ next. So, by show of hands, how many of you are familiar with the term ORM, or Active Record? Oh, not that many people. So, ORM, which stands for Object Relational Mapping, is the concept of connecting a programming language to a database in a meaningful way through libraries or frameworks. And Active Record is the type of ORM where types in a programming language correspond to tables in a database, and objects correspond to rows in a table. So, let's say that we have a struct person. Can you see it? with the fields ID, name, email, and age. We have a vector of these persons, and in the main function we have a connection object which represents a connection to an SQLite database called StuffDB. And I have an SQLite shell open in the video at the bottom right corner, if you can see it. So let's create the table that corresponds to the struct person. For that, let's call the function create table and pass struct person as a template argument to it. Compile this program. And clunk meta is just an alias to clunk with, uh, with some small option. And let's see if our table has been created. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Here it is. Now, let's try to add some rows into the table. For that, let's call the function persist on each element of the vector. Oh, guys, my, my <laughs> fingers are so trembling. <laughs> Well, it's my first talk in English. <laughs> but no, I actually, I gave this talk in Russian conference. Almost, oh no, no, what I'm doing, what I'm doing. <laughs> Persist uh, on each element of the vector, then compile it, run and, oh, now it fails because we are trying to create the table that already exists. Let's drop it then programmatically. Compile, run. Okay, let's select everything from the table. Okay, here we are. It works. And if, you add, if we add one, some, one more column into this table, say height of type double, oh, <laughs> with the default value, let's say it's 6.2. Compile, run. Okay, it works. So magic. And let's try to select something from the table. For that, let's call the function query that returns result in range and query on the struct person. And let's pass a user defined literal to it. Say that we want to create all the people under the age of 35 and print their names. Compile. Run. Okay, here we are. It works. So, please notice that this example is impossible to implement in current C++ because here we need to invade into the struct person, reflect all the members and their names and their values. So, the question. There was a question here. What's the underscore query? Underscore query, it is a user-defined literal from C++11. So, basically, C++11 allows you to define your define literals for, literals for your own types that you have. And here it is some type that, that represents a query. 
So I pass this query into this function query. <laughs> so yeah. All right, let's go back to the presentation, on to classic terms and definitions. And here I want to remind you that uh, apart from the reflection term, we have another similar one called introspection. So what is the difference? Some people say that there is none, some people say that it is too subtle, but Wikipedia says that it exists. So according to the Wikipedia, type introspection is the ability of a program to examine the type of properties of an object at runtime, and reflection is the ability of a computer program to examine, introspect, and modify its own, its own structure and behavior at runtime. That is to say, type introspection is kind of like a subset of reflection. Apart from introspecting a computer program, reflection also implies its modification to some extent. I personally don't like distinguishing between these terms because people so often confuse them. This is why for the purpose of my talk I will be using a slightly different terminology. I will define reflection simply as the ability in a language to examine and obtain data, based, uh, data about base level structures such as classes, variables, their names, addresses, CV qualifiers and specifiers, and all that kind of information. Usually this data is also called metadata. So reflection is basically just an API provided by the compiler to get information about the AST which is already formed at the using of this API. I will also use a different term, injection, that describes code modification or insertion. This term is also used in the proposal on meta-classes. We will talk about this later. So, in contrast to inject, uh, reflection, injection might be described, might be presented as an API of the compiler to insert or modify nodes in the AST. Just a quick of sh show of hands, how many of you have heard about the proposal on meta-classes? Oh, fair amount, good. So, for those of you who haven't or haven't watched the Herb Sutter's talk at CPVCon this year, I want to show you a real-life example where a code injection might be of great use. I worked on a library for high-performance computations called HPX. It provides nice, modern, STL-like API for writing highly parallel applications. The library can also run on multiple machines in a cluster and has this thing called EGAS, which stands for Active Global Address Space. EGAS allows you to address objects across the entire network using just plain C++ API. Those objects are also called components in HPX. And defining the component type is simply defining the usual type, C++ type, with a small yet very annoying exception. And it is that for every method of that class, you need to write some boilerplate code. And this class should be CRTP inherited from, from another, some base class. Of course, there is a helping macro for this. But even with the macro, you know, it's still boring to write this capital letter monsters. Monsters, isn't it? So, meta classes are there to help. Instead of writing all the CRTP-based hacks, we can just define a meta class called HPX component, reflect all the, members, all the members of this class, and inject that boilerplate for us. Here you can see the context declaration, which, is, which has a compound statement, which is guaranteed to be evaluated at compile time. And from that declaration, we are injecting code into the class scope into this arrow operator. For dot 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 is another new statement that iterates over heterogeneous data structures like tuples and unrolls the loop into the sequence of statements. IDX returns uh, C++ identifier from metadata or from compile time strings. So, okay, does it make sense? Okay, and now it is as simple as this to create an HPX component. Here in the main function, we take a reference to an arbitrary node in our cluster. We create an HPX component on that node, and then we call the member function, injected member function, called async compute value, which essentially does an RPC call to compute value function on the object on, on the remote end. So I'm very happy about this feature. It's another big step towards getting rid of macros in C++. But I'm going to shut up now and not talk about code injection anymore. Why? Code injection is another very sophisticated and arguable topic. The way metaclasses perform code injection appears to work well, and I find the syntax very nice and convenient. But the problem is, as I've said, reflection is another very complicated thing that will take quite a while to get to the standard. Personally, I believe that first we need to deal with reflection before talking about injection. For example, you remember what happened to concepts. The idea of concepts has been around for about 20 years, and we still don't have them even in C++17. And you remember that the previous design of concepts was about to get included in C++11, but in 2009 the committee decided that that design was overcomplicated and might lead to a lack of adoption of C++11. Then the concept slide came into play, but at the last standardization meeting, once again some parts of the concepts yes, were just dropped. So we shouldn't step on the same rake. That being said, the idea of code injection still needs to be kept in mind to easily integrate it into the future standards. I also want to make a short disclaimer. 
All the current reflection proposals argue for static reflection in the language instead of runtime because the former seems to have more benefits and benefits and allows us to implement the latter in terms of the former, for example, with libraries. For instance, you can create a serialization library that will serialize and deserialize polymorphic objects by putting some meta information on how to create those objects on the remote end into a factory. Something similar to what registered, the registered type function does in boost serialization, if I remember correctly. But more importantly, static reflection doesn't violate zero overhead abstraction and you don't pay for what you don't use principles as opposed to RTTI. And now we are coming to the main part of the talk to the approaches that are currently being considered by standardization committee. Well, it's so hard to pronounce standardization, because in Russian we say standardization. <laughs> Sorry for this. Okay, but before looking at them, we need to define for ourselves what are the main goals that we need from reflection. I personally believe that reflection should be as simple as possible. It shouldn't be another tool that will only be used by C++ experts. Even though, you know, that reflection in other languages like Java is considered to be a tool that should generally be avoided, there are many applications, especially for library writers, where reflection will be of great use. Compile time is another very important aspect of reflection. Just imagine if your reflection library recursively traverses, I don't know, a complex user-defined type with many members, and uh, I don't know, it checks their names or do whatever. It would be a disaster if it takes a long time for doing th such things. And finally, reflection should be flexible enough to be able to reflect not only types, but also variables, functions, their parameters, return values, I don't know, const expressness, not, no exceptness, <laughs> sorry, yeah, and all the kind of information. There is a nice paper written by David Vanderworld and Louis Dion called Exploring the Design Space of Metaprogramming and Reflection that discusses different approaches for reflection that we are going to cover here. So to operate on base level entities in the program, we need to leave to another level of abstraction that uses metadata. You can call this level meta layer or reflection layer or whatever. Since we agreed that the reflection is static, that is compile time. Now we need to remember what kinds of compile time first class citizens we have in the, lang in the language. And of course, those are types and values of literal types. Literal type concept is just the concept for types whose values can be used in context per context. And then to make computations with these entities, we use different styles of compile time programming. The first one, TMP, has been around for over two, oh, sorry, two decades. Yeah, and it's known to everybody now. I, I think that all generic libraries in some ways use template metaprogramming. Traditional type-based metaprogramming was invented, as I've said, more than 20 years ago, and by an accident, and still used today. In this approach, you represent computational values as types and functions as templates on types. And there is another approach that, again, is based on TMP, but its use is hidden from the user, thanks to C++ for team template variables, automatic type deduction, and other things. Instead of writing these awkward meta functions with angle brackets, colon, colon value, or type syntax, you operate only with traditional function called syntax in this approach. This, it was invented in Boost HANA and used there, and uh, what I was going to say, yeah, in Boost Hena. Yeah, yes, it is much simpler, but still imposes some overhead due to constant template instantiations and type deductions. And C++11, we have another way to do compile time computations based on context from metaprogramming. And in C++14, we made it even simpler. Basically, you write everything in plain C++ syntax, but mark functions and variables with the context per keyword. Then in the context per context, you are guaranteed to have the result at compile time. This part of the tree represents reflection API the compiler might give you. And this part is about how these APIs allow you to define different control flow syntaxes in your code. Interesting to note that every path in this graph corresponds to a different proposal. And I've listed the names here. So let's start from the first proposal, which is called, quite simply, static reflection. In the core of the proposal, there is an operator called reflexpr. It takes a C++ ID expression and returns a unique type called meta object, corresponding to, this, to the entity this ID expression refers to. And there is a supporting library that includes various concepts of different kinds of metadata, and also meta functions that are used to manipulate with these objects. Let's take a look at a simple example. Let's suppose that we have a string object called person. We use the reflex operator on this string, and we get a type, some specific type, meta object type, person m. Then using a concept variable, we static assert that this meta object indeed refers to our variable. And by calling meta function get name, 
we get the actual name of the variable. Then using the meta function get type t, we get a meta object type m. But please notice that this type is not the type state swing itself. It's a meta object that refers to this type. And now we can do reverse transformation using the meta function get reflected type. And then we static assert that this type is, uh, is actually a real state string. So here are the concepts defined by the proposal, and there are a lot of them, not even counting the company and proposal for function reflection. The first one on the top, called meta object, is the most important one as it satisfies to all meta object types. Now let's look at some examples. This generic function converts any enumeration into a string. It's a silly but very ubiquitous use case. For example, the Stack Overflow for, um, has something like 12 questions on how to associate enumeration with strings. So, okay, let's try to figure out what is going on here. I highlighted all the meta operations that I used in the example. Get enumerators function returns a meta objects, sorry, a list of meta objects corresponding to the enumeration members. Get constant extracts the constant from the meta object, and get name gets the name of this constant. And for each is just a helper function that iterates over, over this type list. Is everybody with me? Please ask any question if you don't understand anything. OK, OK, it's quite clear. So generic equal function is a similar example. Here we use another meta function called get data members that returns a meta object sequence that corresponds to members of some type. And then we call the function get pointer v, meta function get pointer v, that returns a pointer to member. And then we compare them. OK. We can do the reverse transformation using an unreflex for operator that is proposed in a company and paper. OK, so from what we've just seen, what are the pros and cons of this proposal? It is flexible enough, of course. There are so many types of different entities we can reflect here, not even counting the accompanying proposal for function reflection. But cons are pretty obvious, I think, that it is awkward and verbose usage due to TMP syntax and slow compile time due to constant template instantiations. Let's move on to the next proposal by Andrew Sutton and Herb Sutter, and, uh, yeah, called Design for Static Reflection, and it is based on heterogeneous value syntax. It is very similar to the previous one, except the reflex per keyword here is changed to dollar, the dollar sign, and it returns a value of a unique type instead of just a unique type. <laughs> and now you use member function syntax instead of this meta function syntax. Yeah, so it seems to be pretty cool. Let's look at example, an example. Here again, we reflect the variable person of type state string. Print its name, reflect the type of the variable, and do reverse transformation using the type name keyboard. Pretty cool, right? So you remember the example of enumeration to string conversion from the previous example. It looked like this. Now it looks simpler. Yeah, I highlighted all the differences. So basically, we do the same. With the dollar sign, we reflect this meta object that refers to enumeration type. Then we, with the help of member function enumerators, we reflect the meta object sequence. Essentially, it is a tuple. And with the help of function for each, we reflect all over, sorry, we iterate over all these members. And then we, with the help of member function value, we check this enumerator, and then print the name. Does it make sense? Good. And yes, uh, the authors go even further and propose a new statement, which we've already seen in the beginning. Yeah. And here is how generic equal function looks in this proposal. So nothing fancy. I don't know about you, but my personal take on this is that the value syntax is much more readable. So to outline pros and cons, I want to say that proposal makes syntax much easier to reason about, as I've said. But still, compilation time leaves a bit to be desired because of constant template instantiations that have happened under the hood and type deductions. 
And now let's talk about reflection that is based on homogeneous value syntax mm -hmm. with support of context for control flow. There are just a couple of proposals that only discuss these ideas, but none of them unfortunately goes any further or provides wording for the ideas. So basically the difference is that in the previous proposal with heterogeneous syntax, every time we reflect any metadata from an entity, the compiler instantiates a new type for us. And the template this type is instantiated from is located in the supporting library. So the final type might look something like this, where the integer template argument is essentially an address of the AST node of this variable. And this is a problem because every time you, you reflect data, you need to instantiate the meta object of it. And for, for example, if you have like, I don't know, long sequence, long sequence of members or something, I don't know, uh, you need to reflect and you iterate over this sequence. You need to like instantiate a specialization every time. And it might be very expensive and slow. This is exactly what the idea of homogeneous syntax tries to avoid. Instead of having a different type for each reflected entity, this idea proposes has been just a single type or finite set of types for all metadata. And in the compiler implementation, this type itself may be just a pointer to the AST node. I'll also use the reflex for operator instead of the dollar sign that's because later we will see a reverse operator with the similar syntax. It's not necessary to have a single type actually, as I said, because this way we kind of erase information about the type of the reflected data, something similar to what void PTR does, but in the context of meta objects. It might make more sense to have maybe some inheritance based hierarchy of these meta types, but I'm not sure that it should look something like this. This is actually a diagram of different AST declarations in Clang. You might also ask, why is this variable not marked context? Right, it would make sense for it to be, but consider this, it should be guaranteed that, that all meta objects can be initialized by runtime values. So for the compiler, it is known that every meta object is context for already because the only way to get them is by calling reflex operator or calling another meta object operation on already context per metadata. So I assume we can just omit the context per keyword for meta objects. In the same fashion, we can re reflect the name of the variable, the type of the variable, and the real type of the variable. For a type meta object, please note that unreflex per, yeah, if we pass a type meta object to unreflex per keyword, it might be used as a type specifier. And if we pass, I don't know, maybe expression or maybe something, or oh, sorry, meta object that corresponds to variable, it might be, it might be used as an exp in, in expression context. Then we study assert that yes, this type is essentially a string. Okay. This uh, operator might have a different name though, but I think it's not a big deal. So apart from having faster compilation time in theory, what are the other advantages this approach has over the previous ones? Consider for, for example, a very common use case we, which we need to, yes, use case in which we uh, look for a specific type in a vector of types. It would look like as follows. Uh, yes, it's quite simply. And one day when we have context for algorithms in standard library, we might just use find if instead. I want to go further and say that all the standard algorithms will work just fine with uh, sequences of metadata. And please notice that this, is, this cannot be said for the previous proposals because uh, in previous proposals we use Mm, for every reflected data, we use a different type, and then we would need to come up with a new algorithm library for heterogeneous containers. Okay, you can also count how much padding your compiler has added to your data structure, like this. Does it make sense? So basically, we just we take a type, we iterate over all the fields, we reflect, we reflect that field type, we get the size of of the type, and then we Sub subtract the size of the whole structure. Sorry, this sub subtract the size of all the fields from the size of the whole structure. Yeah. Or even more practical use case that is stolen from the Lewis proposal. For example, given that we have x86 64 bit architecture and we don't use any exotic compiler, 
what would be the size of this tract? Does anybody know? 32. Right, and this is because the compiler introduced padding here, a lot of padding actually here. So for, for example, we have a node, it has no padding, int, right after int, in between of int and node pointer, there is a padding of four, I guess, and right after this variable, there is a padding of seven. So, but what if we change the order of the element, of the elements in the middle? What would be the size of the structure then? Yes, it, it changed. <laughs> the size becomes 24, we packed it a bit. And say if you have a list with a large number of nodes, then changing the order would save you like 25% of your memory. Since the problem of large partying arises only when an object with strict uh, alignment requirements follows the object with less strict requirements, the general technique used by, I don't know, low-level embedded developers in projects that have serious memory constraints is to order elements by decreasing alignment. In order to do this, we can just employ the sort algorithm from the standard library, get the resulting vector of metatypes, and when we have an injection in C++, we can just inject this vector into the resulting structure. I played around a bit with this idea of homogeneous reflection and started implementing it in Clan. And it worked quite well, I should say, until I, I ran into a tiny problem. Yeah, in C++, you know every expression must have a type. And this type is defined at the parsing stage. But consider this example. What is the type of the variable bar? Please notice that parameter t in this context is not a constant expression anymore. Or slightly more complicated example. It turns out that if we allow the syntax, the type would vary between calls to this function, depending upon the value of the meta object passed to it. And this is something that reminds us of templates. The type of bar num becomes dependent, and all expressions involving this type, this variable, sorry, become type and value dependent. So then the main question is, should functions that have meta objects as parameters become essentially function templates? If you remember concepts yes, for example, we already had something similar. There was a notion called abbreviated function template syntax, where you didn't need to write the template keyword in front of the function. You could just use auto or concept name in parameters. We may also make this function a template explicitly and allow meta objects to be used as template parameters. Or we can just restrict our reflex for operator to only take constant expressions. But then I guess we would limit a number of use cases. To conclude, we now have a good syntax, flexibility, and compile time is presumably faster because there is no instantiations involved in the process of computations. Yet it's not clear how to reflect things in non-context per context. And finally, I want to show you another example of how reflection would help us in real life. To do this, I will use the Andrew Sutton's implementation of his proposal based on heterogeneous value syntax. Let me go to my command line real quick. How many of you guys are familiar with the Google Micro Benchmark Framework? Oh, not a lot. I, I will have to explain how it works. So, okay, it's an awesome tool. You should definitely try it. Okay, here it is. Is it clear? Or you need to make, I need to make font higher, larger, like this. Okay, here is what the simple example of benchmarks look like. So here we have like two benchmarks, row for loop and range based for loop. I know this is a silly question. <laughs> Oh, sorry, silly benchmark. And uh, yes, there are a couple of macros here, you can see it. It is benchmark macro and benchmark main macro. And I'm not a fan of macros, I, I, I want to say. And I want to completely eliminate macros from this example. This is the purpose of this example. But let me show you how it works. I compile it. I run it, okay. There is no uh, reflection here, I, I want to show you. 
something different. So I don't like this macro benchmark, as I've said. I want to, I, and I want to use C++ 11 attributes. And for the purpose of this example, actually, I needed to hack, hack Clunk a bit to allow custom attributes because, you know, in C++, it's not, it's not something that is in the standard yet. So, yeah, I just marked this function as with the attribute benchmark. And let's see what this macro benchmark essentially does. For that, let's go to the sources of the library. Benchmark. Oh, there is a lot of code. There is a lot of code, yeah. So, yeah, here it is. So what it does, it, it essentially, it, it creates a static variable and which does some registration. So let's create a function here that will take a meta object corresponding to some scope and call this function run benchmarks in pass the scope object. Okay. And then let's iterate. So, so what we are going to do is to iterate over all members in the scope, check if a specific member of function and iterates over all attributes, find this attribute benchmark and do this registration. So I'm going to use some function for each and uh, for each members in this scope. I want to pass a lambda function. And here I want I want to check whether the, whether it is a function. Okay, and if it is a function, then I want to iterate over all over all attributes. Right. Oh sorry. And pass another lambda function. And check whether it is really a benchmark attribute. Oh yeah, I want to use C++11 uh, user-defined literals. Yeah, it's another example of user-defined literals because I don't want to call strcmp. In order to do this, I need to introduce namespace string literals or just literals. Okay, and if it's essentially a benchmark attribute, then I want to insert this code, this registration code here. Oh, yeah. So, and change these arguments of, the, of this benchmark macro into something different. And it's going to be name of the function and pointer to the function. Oh, and I, I don't like this formatting that Vim has done for me, so I, I need to use Clunk Format plugin. Okay, now it's better, at least for me. So there is one more macro left here. It is benchmark main. And let's see what this macro essentially does. Oh, it doesn't do anything tricky. So let's just copy this code into this function. And now the only thing left is to propagate this argc and argv variables into the function. Okay, so now let's let's create the function main and reflect this namespace called rov vs range. Oh. And then call this function. In ns and argv, argc, argv. Okay, let's compile it. I'm not sure that it's going to compile. Oh, this is weird. It's the first time it compiles. <laughs> like, yeah. 
okay, and it seems to work. <laughs> I'm so surprised. So yeah, and and, and, uh, and yeah, and you can see here that in this specific run, <laughs> range-based follow turned out to be faster. But it's not surprising, actually. So yeah, here are the links to the. Im oh, sorry. Here are the links to the implementations that are already here, and I used in the last example. I used this. This in all my examples that I showed today, I've used this implementation. And reference to the papers that discuss reflection and injection ideas, worth reading, actually. And this is final slide. Thank you so much for coming. It has taken only 35 minutes. I expected like I wouldn't have time. <laughs> so yeah, if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer them. Oh, cool. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, do you think one of these will make it into C plus plus twenty for definite, or is it? Uh, oh, it's a good question. I don't think so. I don't even think. I, I'm not sure that it will be part of even C plus plus twenty three. But it is something that I really hope. But I'm not sure about it. I'm, you know, I'm. <laughs> yeah. I, I've given already example uh, of concepts that they are not here yet, and. So I, I'm not sure, but I really hope that will be a part of, at, at least reflection, not code injection, will be part of C++ 23, but not 20, because I remember there was a paper of Ville Voltilainen, and I'm not sure that I, I, I uh, pronounce his surname properly, and the paper was about the future directions for C++ 20, and there was no reflection there, so, yeah. It's unfortunate. Any other questions? Huh. Which one do you like best? Which proposal, uh, which proposal? are you for? Yeah. I, I like the last one, which is not a proposal, but just the idea. I like this much more because of the pros and cons, because it has better syntax, it's, it is flexible, and it has fast compile time. It is most important because we need to think a lot of about fast compilation now. Because, for example, yeah, <laughs> it is something that we don't like in C++ because it takes so much time to compile. <clears throat> yeah, but uh, is this still an argument? Uh, I mean, with, for example, the modules TS, this might not be a problem any longer. Yeah, it's a good argument. It might help in the future, but I'm not sure yet. <laughs> So uh, there is one instance where you use unreflexible on something to compute the size of. Does it also work without uh, unreflexible? Oh, you mean this? Yeah, this one. Would it work without uh, unreflexible? Yeah. You mean here, first unreflexible? Yes. It wouldn't work because field type returns just a meta object that corresponds to corresponds to the real type and the size of the of the sprite might be like i don't know unspecified or something oh it makes sense to have a mem member function size yeah so we might have used size function if yeah. was it that you just asked no i just came up with oh okay yeah Okay, I don't know if you don't have any questions. Yeah, I want to thank everybody for coming <laughs> again. Okay.